Welcome to another episode of The Qualified Body. I'm your host, Damien Blinkinsop. Today we have the first episode on longevity and aging. To introduce the topic and its full complexity, and it is complex, but in as simple a manner as possible, I wanted to make sure we had the best person to do that. Longevity is a subject very close to my heart and something I've been following for over 15 years now. So I'm sure you'll notice in today's interview, I was just a little bit more nervous at times during the conversation. I've been following today's guest for many years. So finally getting to talk to him one-on-one was a pretty big deal for me. So bear with me on that or have a good chuckle at me. I consider today's guest a visionary and very much a general strategist, which may seem like a funny thing to call someone working in the area of science and longevity. But if you think about it, to bring visions into the world takes visionary planning, careful investment of efforts, and effectively managing risks along the way. That's something I learned from my strategic consulting career. And if you think about business, great and successful businesses like Apple and its visionary Steve Jobs, but we don't often apply these ideas to other endeavors like science. But shouldn't we? So that we can better guarantee the results we seek? As we'll see in today's interview, Aubrey de Grey has taken a very strategic approach towards defining the problem of ending aging, preventing aging, and longevity, and planning a practical route to solving it. It's rare that an article or book that mentions longevity and life extension research does not mention Aubrey de Grey. He has become the greatest activist and proponent of longevity of our time. He is the chief science officer of the SENS Research Foundation. That stands for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, which basically means ending aging. It is a not-for-profit organization funding research into longevity in universities around the world, and we'll talk more about that in the interview. Aubrey is also the author of Ending Aging, the rejuvenation breakthroughs that could reverse human aging in our lifetime, right? So our lifetime, he's talking about right now in which he defines the seven aging processes which we must solve to end aging. He is also the author of The Mitochondrial Free Radical Theory of Aging, which, you know, we've talked about mitochondria a lot previously, and you'll see some of that in there as well. And he has a very popular TED presentation with millions of views named A Roadmap to End Aging, which is a good intro to the subject also, and we'll put that in the show notes. All these books and presentations capture his strategy and vision to end aging. In today's interview, we also look at Aubrey's assessment of a lot of the common longevity strategies people are using today, such as caloric restriction and telomerase-based therapies, which are currently the most popular in Reservatrol. And his views contrast sharply with what you'll read about in the general press or even in the life extension kind of press on the value of these approaches to life extension and the real impact they can have. As usual, to get the show notes, the list of biomarkers talked about, the apps and labs and links to all of this stuff and everything mentioned in the show and the transcript of today's interview, you can go to thequantifiedbody.net forward slash episodes. And this episode will be listed at the top if it's new and a bit further down if you're listening to this a bit later. The Quantified Body. New technologies are bringing us more and better data on our bodies every day. This data promises to help us make better decisions for better health, higher performance, less disease, and greater longevity. In the Quantified Body, we explore this promise to find out where it is creating real world results, improving bodies, and improving lives. Aubrey, thank you very much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, aging as a disease. Obviously, this isn't what everyone thinks today. So, why would you describe aging as a disease? Well, actually, precisely because that is a controversial use of terminology, I mm. don't tend to do that. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I tend to try to sidestep the, um, you know, the ambiguities of terminology as much as possible and yeah. so cut to the chase. So I say <clears throat> whether or not we choose to call aging a disease, what we can certainly say is that it's a medical problem. It's bad for you. It makes, you work, it makes your body and your head work less well, and eventually it kills you. And that's what I call a medical problem. Okay. Okay, fine. When you're looking at it from this perspective, are there things like in previous uh, interviews I've seen that you talk about when we're young, we, we can die and we can get injured from certain things. And when we age, when we're older, say in our 40s, 50s, we tend to get other health conditions which you could say are linked to aging. Are there certain conditions which you would say that if we didn't age, we wouldn't 
have to put up with these health or functionality restrictions? Absolutely, there are. And actually, let me, let me elaborate on that by reference to your first question about disease. Because I think actually the big problem with the terminology, with the use of the word disease, is not so much that we don't call aging a disease. The problem is that we do call things like Alzheimer's disease and cancer and atherosclerosis, we call them diseases. That's the mistake. And the reason it's a mistake is because actually the difference between those things and the things that we rightly call diseases, like you know, infections, is a much bigger difference, both in terms of the symptoms and the progression of the symptoms and the ways that we might be able to treat them, a much bigger difference than the difference between those diseases on the one hand and the aspects of aging that we don't call disease, like um, declining function of the immune system or loss of muscle or gain of fat or whatever. I think that if we are looking for a truly accurate and instructive, useful um, classification, if you like, of the various ways in which we can get sick, then a much better one is to say that aging consists of everything that goes wrong with the body or the mind, predominantly for those people who were born a long time ago. And diseases are things that can affect young people just as much as older people. Right, right. So the distinction, like, uh, like to just give some examples to the audience, would it be things like Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, uh, even multiple sclerosis, which I th don't think people tend to get before the age of 30, for instance, um, cardiovascular disease, would all of these kind of things be linked into that area? Kind of, yeah. I mean, certainly multiple sclerosis is a bit of a grey area, whether you would really call it a, a, an aspect of ageing, not because it happens rather earlier than the other diseases you listed, but also because it certainly doesn't happen to everybody. Whereas the um, diseases of old age, the, common, the commonest ones, whether it's cardiovascular disease, cancers, um, Alzheimer's, these things tend to hit everybody at more or less the same age. So, of course, some people die of one thing, some people die of another thing, but the only real reason for that is because of small differences in the rate at which different people accumulate the damage that drives that that that, that um, results in these diseases so for most people who die of cancer die with alzheimer's at some level or other most people who die of atherosclerosis die with cancer it's just that it hasn't got quite so far along right 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 so in in your book the end of aging uh you describe the seven causes of aging, would all of these be classified? Would it be correct to call them some type of damage to the body? I would call them damage, yes. In fact, again, you know, this is another kind of terminology question. I would say really that the best way to define the use of the word damage uh, in relation to aging is simply to say that damage consists of exactly those changes to the structure and composition of the body at the molecular and cellular level that, on the one hand, arise as side effects of being alive in the first place, side effects of the, the stuff that the body does to keep us alive from one, one day to the next. And on the other hand, they accumulate throughout life. They get progressively more and more abundant, and eventually they get more abundant than the amount that the body is set up to tolerate so that means they start to impair and eventually completely eliminate physiological function. Right. So these are clearly changes which take place because of aging, um, because of the processes which are going on as, as we're living. I would say they are aging. It's not so much they're caused by aging mm. or anything, they are aging. Right. The definition of aging is these changes in molecular and cellular structure. Right, right. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it because, you know, most of us think of aging is, I, I don't know, what we're looking at outside the body, you know, the wrinkles. And when you're looking at people, you can see they're aging. But in a respect, we could say that the actual things you've defined as changing within the body would be aging. So could you please outline what those are and, and which ones are the most important for you or if, if they're all the same? Like, well, what is this kind of framework that you have? And which ones are you focused, most focused on currently? The classification into these seven major categories was really the big breakthrough that allowed me to see that the repair of damage was not only 
the most promising approach to combating aging with medicine, it was actually a feasible approach that could realistically be implemented within a, a matter of decades. Because if you've got a thousand different things to deal with, then you know a thousand different therapies are going to take a long time to develop. But if you can classify them into a, main, a very much more manageable number of categories, such that within each category you're basically doing the same treatment for every example within the category, then the whole thing becomes much more feasible looking. And that's exactly what I was able to do. So, you know, the categories are very simple things like having progressively fewer cells in a particular organ or tissue because cells are dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. Or there's, for example, the accumulation of molecular waste products in the cell because the cell is creating this waste product as a byproduct of something it needs to do and the cell does not have any machinery either to break it down or to excrete it. So it accumulates. So in each of these things, we can look at and we can point to particular diseases and disabilities of old age that are predominantly caused by one or another of these things. So um, that's, what, uh, that's what we work on. And yes, uh, we, we feel that all seven of these categories of damage are equally important. Um, certainly, well, there's one exception, I guess, which is mitochondrial mutations, where we can't 100% certainly say that it matters as much as the others. Actually, it might even matter more than any of the others. We don't know. But all the others, we can say they matter pretty much equally as much because we can point to a particular major age-related pathology, kills people at more or less the same age, um, that is mainly driven by that type of damage. I see. So you're saying that a pathology can be linked to each of these aging processes. Yes. For example, molecular garbage inside the cell that I just mentioned. That's definitely the reason we get heart disease, atherosclerosis. Molecular garbage outside the cell is, is a major cause of heart disease in centenarians. Cell loss is the major cause of Parkinson's disease and so on. Great. Thanks for that clarification. So you've outlined a, a roadmap to basically end aging. And uh, you've brought to light uh, two concepts uh, that I understand is like there are bridges and there's uh, something called longevity escape velocity. Could you explain how these are eventually going to end aging or, or stop us from having to go through this process of aging? Sure. OK, well, so first of all, let me talk about bridges. So that's actually not my terminology. That comes mainly from Ray Kurzweil has often pointed out that there's a certain amount that we can do today to postpone the ill health of old age. And that's good. That's all very well. But we'd like to do more. And that maybe we will be able, some of us anyway, to postpone the ill health of old age today with methods already available well enough to still be around in time for therapies that are not yet available because they haven't yet been developed. If that can be done, then, of course, we get, we get an additional amount of life and we may be around for the next generation of therapy and so on. And that concept, um, well, he normally talks about three major phases, what we can do today, what we might be able to do in the next couple of decades with biotechnology, and then what we might be able to do in decades after that using more non-biological solutions such as nanotechnology. And that's a fine way of putting it. Uh, certainly the biotechnological approaches that he favours are pretty much identical to the ones I favour. And biotechnology is certainly not an area in which I can claim much expertise, but I think he's more or less on the mark there as well. Um, we, do, we are some way apart, actually, Ray and myself, with regard to how, how beneficial for most people uh, what things are today, things that you can do already. And so I think that um, bridge one, as he calls it, may be not much of a bridge. But by and large, the concept, we stand together on this concept. Uh, so the phrase longevity escape velocity, which you mentioned, is indeed some, a phrase that I invented. And here, I'm not splitting the process of getting from here to indefinite longevity into a particular number of phases, like three. I'm just saying that once we get a certain way along this process, we're safe because we will be improving the quality and comprehensiveness of these therapies fast enough to stay one step ahead of the problem. We'll essentially be repairing the damage that we couldn't yet repair well enough 
that the overall abundance of damage will at no point reach a level that exceeds what the body is set up to tolerate. Right. And this relies on the concept that, uh, like medical technology, that biotechnology will be advancing exponentially? Oh, not at all. Rather than... Not at all. So okay. um, this is something which, uh, again, I heard while I've talked about a lot with respect to, uh, to information technology, that um, we, can we can see the accelerating change where progress is made at a faster rate as time goes on. In the case of longevity escape velocity, that may well happen, but the key point is it does not need to happen. In fact, if we are able, say, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, to reach this point where people are essentially not getting older, they are being repaired as fast as they're aging, then it turns out that thereafter, we can actually proceed at only that same pace, perhaps even slow down a little bit, and we'll still be doing well enough, simply because the rate at which the damage we cannot yet repair is accumulating will diminish as the types of damage that we can't yet repair become fewer and fewer. Great. Thank you for those clarifications. So what for you is the, is the first and most important step, or are you really... Right now, are you are you focusing um, because you do funding of research and you kind of prioritize things? Are you are you prioritizing any of these steps in particular, or are you trying to spread your investments so that you kind of manage your risk? Very much the latter. We're spreading. We um ha we we have our fingers in all of these pies because we feel that it's it we, you know, we'd feel pretty stupid if we focused on some of them and then the other ones didn't get done by us or by anybody else and people carried on dying on schedule even though most of the problems have been fixed right well that we need to make sure especially for the areas which are least fashionable are being most severely neglected by other people that it's vital for us to move forward and in fact that is the only criterion that we use that really does determine what we choose to work on and not to work on. So the real manifestation of it is that we do very little work in stem cells. Uh, stem cell work is very limited simply because so many other people are already working in that area. It's very burgeoning, very fashionable. So our work our effort would be a bit of a drop in the ocean, whereas we are you know, the leading group working in many of the other areas. Great, so basically you're choosing the least fashionable topics yeah. so that the things get pushed on. And we actually do need to fix all of these problems. I mean, that's your assumption in order to extend life and create longevity. That's right. I don't think it's even an assumption. I think we know it. Okay, great, great. So one of your other books looks specifically at mitochondrial mutations and the free radical theory uh, of disease. Why did you uh, specifically write a book about that topic? Great question. Yeah, so that was a long time ago. I wrote well, that book was published in 1999. It's actually the only other book I've written. I've only written two books total. It was simply the first area that I got interested in. When I decided I wanted to work on aging with a view to doing something about it, of course, I started out knowing nothing about the subject. In fact, I didn't know all that much biology. I had been a computer scientist for my research career until that point. So I had a lot to learn. And it just, you know, obviously, there's, you learn some things before other things just by random chance, I ended up gravitating into the area of mitochondrial mutations as my main focus before I got interested in the other things. So for the first few years of my career in gerontology in the late 90s, that was what I was working on, and that was where I published my first half dozen papers or so. And it was also, I was, well, actually, my, first, my very first paper came to the attention of a publisher who did, um, you know, low print run academic books and said, uh, and he liked the way I write, so I said, you know, fancy writing me books. So I said, all right. And that was the result. So the material in there covers pretty much my first three or four years of biogerontology research. And it actually was also the, the um, de facto, it was my PhD. It was submitted to the University of Cambridge and they gave me a PhD for it. Oh, great. So would everything you wrote in there still be valid today or are there things that you've discovered which would uh, you change some of that? So the fantastic thing is that more or less everything is actually still true. There have been, of course, some minor discoveries that have changed things. But the broad sway of what I was writing there is certainly still true, uh, with one big exception. But that big exception is exactly the exception that you'd like to have. Namely, as time's gone on, new techniques, new ideas, new, new discoveries have been made that have essentially 
provided shortcuts. They have made the job of fixing this problem easier. And that's true also for the book that I wrote for Ending Aging, which is, which I wrote nearly half as long ago as I wrote the um, mitochondrial free radical theory book. So it's pretty good that these ideas are standing the test of time so well. The, the seven-point plan that we work on is pretty much identical to what I was describing more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago. So that's really a, it's circumstantial, but nevertheless quite strong evidence that we're on the right line if this model is so robustly standing the test of time. Oh, congratulations, because that's not an easy feat, with, given with everything, how everything's changing so fast in, in biology and so on. Um, so you've talked a bit about, um, one thing you mentioned earlier was, except when you were talking about this, the seven different areas, uh, causes of aging, you said that mitochondrial uh, damage may or may not be one of the most important ones. Why is there that area of uncertainty around mitochondria specifically? Simply because there is no one major pathology that we can point to where we can say clearly that there is a chain of events that goes from this particular type of damage to that particular pathology. In the case of every other, all the other six types of damage, we can point to a particular pathology and say that it's established. It's not even a hypothesis that's actually known, absolutely agreed, that the main driver of that pathology is the lifelong accumulation of that particular type of damage. Great, great. So is that because we need to do more research to understand properly this mechanism in mitochondrial damage so we could say that we understand it less than the others? I don't think so, actually. I think the reason is the, as an actual fact of the biology rather than about an understanding of the biology. I think that it's possible that mitochondrial mutations simply don't matter very much in aging. But it's more likely that they do matter, but only by a very indirect route. And if it's indirect, then it may be very um, pleiotropic, very ubiquitous. It may be something that affects pretty much all aspects of aging, but in a subtle manner. So if you look at my book from 1999, you'll see that there is some discussion of a rather elaborate mechanism. And in fact, so elaborate that a lot of people just didn't like it because it was too elaborate but which basically says, well, if mitochondrial mutations are accumulating even to relatively low levels, they may be able to be disproportionately toxic by essentially damaging molecules in the bloodstream. And if they do that, then those molecules can then get into other cells and spread the damage around and kind of amplify it. This model is still very much a hypothesis. It's by by no means been shown to be true, but it hasn't been shown to be false either. And in fact, bits of it occasionally here and there end up acquiring um, little bits of supporting data. There was a paper actually just out in, in Nature just a few weeks ago, which was the first one to um, support one little technical detail of that um, hypothesis that was had previously been completely controversial. Great, great. It seems to me like mitochondria have become quite fashionable lately, just, just from my perspective. I don't know if you'd agree with that. When you're talking about the least fashionable versus the, the quite fashionable, if you look, there's a there's a lot of supplements that tend to target more mitochondria, and they, the word just comes up a lot more. So yes, in a general sense, mitochondria are very fashionable. Lots of people work on them. The conference, the major preeminent conferences on mitochondria are bigger than ever, and so on. Yeah, but right. the particular approach, the particular question of how we might be able to restore health to cells that have been taken over by mitochondrial mutations, that's obviously a very, very narrow area within mitochondriology. Uh, basically, that's not fashionable at all. The reason it's not is because people just think it can't be done. It's in the nature of science that people work on things that they think they can succeed on um, and get published and promoted and all those things. And that means that the hardest things often don't get worked on at all. Right, right, absolutely. So, like, Dr. Thomas Seyfried is, is well known for his ideas around mitochondria and metabolism and cancer. Do your ideas connect with his, or are they different? I don't actually know that name. Tell me about this guy and his ideas. With the metabolic uh, theory of cancer? Okay. Well, there are various metabolic theories of cancer, but go on. Tell me the ideas a little bit, and I'll tell you what I think of them. Well, well the idea is, is basically it's, it's, it's about free radical damage of the mtDNA, and once that's damaged, the mitochondria are not functioning. So they're not giving sufficient energy to the cells. And so the idea is, is from there, 
that the uh, cells start behaving in a different manner, which includes uh, cancer. Got it. All right. So um, certainly that uh, stated that simplistically, that theory is not correct. Um, variations on I'm sure I'm sure I'm not doing it justice at all. <laughs> variations on that idea may have some validity. Certainly, we see in aging that normal cells that are not cancerous at all accumulate mitochondrial mutations. Only a small minority of cells do that, but the ones that do get completely taken over by those mutations. In cancer, we don't see those same mutations. We do see some mutations sometimes. And certainly one thing that we see much more ubiquitously is a depression of mitochondrial function even in the absence of any actual mutation. So the function is depressed by some other means. And we certainly have, there are certainly a number of theories out there that, that describe how cancer cells may obtain some kind of advantage. They may protect themselves from the immune system, for example, by doing things like that. Are reducing their, um, uh, their their oxidative metabolism. So if that's the um, general theory that's being put forward, then yes, there is a certain amount of validity to it. But the thing about cancer is that there are an awful lot of ways this can occur. There are an awful lot of ways that, can, that cells can discover to escape the normal controls that stop cells from dividing when they shouldn't. So they have to do a bunch of things like breaking down the intracellular matrix, they have to ignore signals that tell them not to divide, they have to ignore signals that tell them to die, they have to, as I say, resist the um, attack from the immune system. All of these things are really hard. And any cancer that has reached a size where it's come to the notice of a clinician is, has already jumped through a million hoops. So, yeah, lots of different ways to get to be that way. Great, great. Thank you. So today we have a lot of things in the, in the press. Uh, there's a lot of products and there's a fair amount of research around topics which supposedly could help to give us longevity. Some of these are caloric restriction. Uh, so and linked to that fasting, autophagy, uh, mitophagy, and then we have the telomeres, the telomerase and some others. For any of these things that are available today, uh, like we can we can stop and, and look at them s separately. I understand that you feel that none of them are actually targeting any of the seven areas or in any of the seven causes of disease sufficiently to actually extend our life. Um, so could you talk a little bit about why you feel that is um, perhaps you want to like tackle the biggest one, which is calorie restriction, for example? Yes. By and large, these simple approaches that we have today are not even hypothesized to actually repair damage the way that sense is trying to do. The best that can be said about these things that, that people, that their proponents will say, is that they may slow down the subsequent accumulation of more damage. So, you know, that's still good. That means you're postponing the age at which the damage reaches an abundance that is insupportable. But... Um, of course, the later you start, the, the older you are when you start doing such a thing, even if it works, um, the less benefit you're going to get because you've already accumulated all the damage at the, at the original rate. So that's bad enough. But yes, as you say, I am also very pessimistic about the ability of these approaches even to slow down the accumulation of damage by a meaningful amount. In very short-lived species, calorie restriction is very effective. We can certainly increase the lifespan of a mouse from, let's say, two and a half years to three and a half years using calorie restriction. And that's pretty impressive. But if we go further down the evolutionary chain and we ask about small invertebrates like worms, for example, that live no, normally live only a few weeks, it turns out that calorie restriction can do a great deal more. You can multiply the longevity of a worm by a factor of maybe three or four by calorie restriction. And it, it, the unfortunate thing is that this correlation, this inverse correlation between the natural lifespan of the species and the extent to which that lifespan can be multiplied by calorie restriction, is it extends the other way as well. So some years ago, people did a calorie restriction experiment on dogs, and they only got a 10% increase in lifespan instead of like 40% that you might get in mice. And more recently, we've had a couple of experiments that went on for more than 20 years looking at monkeys in, under calorie restriction. They finally reported and they got a lot less than 10%. In fact, one of them got basically nothing. So it's not looking too good. 
And the worst of it is that this is what we should have expected, because it's actually what's predicted by evolutionary theory. It basically, simply because long famines are not so frequent as short famines, we are unlikely to have the ability that to have evolved the ability to respond to long famines in a manner that would increase our um, evolutionary fitness. Whereas short famines, we have we experience frequently enough, irrespective of how long the lifespan, the natural lifespan is, that it makes sense to have that ability. That's great. Um, and of course, currently, the more fashionable topic around caloric restriction and, and fasting is intermittent fasting, which is you know, typically anything between 18 and 24 hours for most people. Do you have a different view of, of that and the idea that it switches on autophagy, which can you know, help to clear up some of cell debris? Um, no, I do not. No, no, I do not. It's absolutely the same. The kinds of metabolic changes and gene expression changes that are induced are basically identical to approximation. Uh, whether you have continuous calorie restriction or intermittent fasting or whether you use drugs that essentially trick the body into thinking it's on calorie restriction when it isn't, like rapamycin, or whether you use genetic modifications in model organisms that trick the body in that way by turning on the same pathways. It's no surprise, you know. I mean, all of these things are turning on the same response. They're just turning it on in different ways. So, you're, of course, you're going to get the same response. Great. Thank you very much. So the other big area, I guess, I mean, you could tell me if you see this as the other big area because you, you do a lot of these interviews and you probably get the same kind of rejections. I think the other big area is telomeres and, and telomerase, which has become very fashionable now. Um, and I understand, you know, of course, that you, you think that isn't an area that's going to help us either. Sure. So um, the telomere is a critical part of the cell and the organism, and we definitely need to understand how it changes with aging and the extent to which those changes are good or bad. But we definitely cannot say at this point that the changes we see during aging are uniformly bad, and therefore that the thing to do would be to stop those changes from happening. The reason we can't say that is because it seems that large animals, well, large mammals, and certainly humans, uh, have made use of the telomere as a kind of way to get a trade-off, get the best of both worlds, to a point, um, as between two important aspects of aging. One of them being the, in, the, the inability of cells to, well, let me step back and say it a little differently. One of them being the increasing inability of cells to divide, and the other being the increasing tendency of cells to get into a state where they divide when we wish they didn't. Most of our cells, let's remember, do not divide. Or if they do, they only divide very rarely on demand. Like, for example, the skin cells at the bottom layer of the skin that divide like crazy when you have a cut so as to close the wound. It's only a small proportion of our cells, the few cell types, the stem cells, the rapidly renewing tissues like the blood, which divide regularly. And those are the only cells that have a potential problem of telomere shortening. Telomere shortening is something that happens when cells divide because of the nature of DNA replication. And eventually, when cells have divided enough, they end up getting telomeres that are so short that bad things happen in the cell. I won't take the time to go into what bad things. Um, but the cell basically gets unhappy. So... Cells that divide rapidly need to compensate for this, and they have an enzyme called telomerase, which does so. But cells that don't need that capacity because they just don't divide often enough, they just don't make this enzyme telomerase. And most people believe that the reason why they don't make it is so that if they mutate so as to become cancerous, then they, the cancer will not be able to grow large enough to kill us because the cell, that will require enough cell division that the telomeres will get short and bad things will happen to the cancer cells and the cancer will just wither away. So the question then is, if we want to do better than what evolution has done, how do we address this trade-off? One way might be to make, the, make most of our cells create more telomerase, more of this enzyme. That would allow cells in the blood, for example, to divide more than they currently do. And that would be interesting because it might make the blood continue to work better and the gut continue to work better and so on. But it would have the risk of exacerbating cancer. 
the alternative is to go in the exact opposite direction, to bear down on telomerase and make it and get ourselves to make less of it. That might be a really good way to suppress cancer, but it might exacerbate the more degenerative aspects. It might make our blood age faster, for example. We simply don't know which of these approaches is going to be um, going to be better. Because really, it's not just which of those things you do, it's also how you cope with the side effects that you're creating. You're going to make one or other of the sides of the, um, of the equation worse. You've got to find some secondary therapy to alleviate that. And we, of course, don't know yet. So a number of people are working on the telomerase stimulation side of the equation, trying to rescue the aging of dividing cells by giving them more telomerase and then trying to find some other way to deal with any cancer problems that might arise. And we're going the other way. We're saying let's deal with cancer by suppressing telomerase and let's use other methods to deal with the cell division problems that might arise. Right. And that seems to be because you know, cancer is one of the most sure things which is actually going to kill us versus the other side of the equation um, tends to, you're saying, is, is more of a functional impact rather than a kind of end end of life kind of impact? Well, I wouldn't quite put it like that. I mean, there is still a big question over the extent to which telomere shortening really contributes to pathologies of old age. So definitely, telomeres get shorter in blood in older people, but nobody's really been able to show that they get so short as to be, you know, to, to, to cause loss of function. So yeah. we may actually be, you know, not, not need to worry about that in a currently normal lifetime. But for sure, if we were to suppress telomerase in the manner that I've been talking about as an anti-cancer therapy, then we would create a problem, even if the problem doesn't already exist. Right, right. When we're dealing with really complex problems, it's been shown that that, that can often um, be, be the case with therapies. So, um, you know, a, a key thing we talk about in this uh, podcast is any aspects of quantification and... With respect to longevity, I'm wondering if there's anything that you feel is worth monitoring to track how we are aging. So now currently it's fashionable with telomeres to measure the, the, the telomeres and, and, you know, they have indexes which are saying, you know, your telomeres versus someone else your age are above average or below average in terms of how many you have left, basically. Are there any biomarkers that you feel can validly track the progress of aging and perhaps how it varies between different people based on you know their lifestyles or their environment or their genetics or any other factors that might be affecting the rate at which they age yeah it's a really tough question the um nih the uh, the national institute of health actually put a huge amount of money several years ago many years ago now into a long-term study trying to identify biomarkers of aging that were really reliable and it was basically completely unsuccessful. They basically found nothing. Um, now, people haven't given up on this, but the reason they haven't given up is because of complexity. Essentially, there's an awful lot of things you can die of. So, first of all, you've got to say, what does, what does one mean by a biomarker of aging? Well, it has to define that somehow. One way of saying it is a predictor of how long you're going to live right now, how, what your remaining longevity is. Or you could say you're a man in healthy longevity, but then you have to define health, and that gets a little bit fuzzy as well. So it's actually quite hard to even define what you mean by a biomarker of aging. But even once you've um, got past that difficulty, because there are so many different things that go wrong, you don't expect to have one simple or even fairly simple number that says something like this. You expect, I mean, one way of saying it is that you're as old as your weakest link. So you're going to have to, you're going to expect that you would want to measure a lot of things and say that you know, each of them points to a certain probability of getting a severe case of this or that type of age related pathology in this or that amount of time. And certainly some things are, pro, are more influential than others. These things affect each other, and we may be able to point to things that are a bit more indicative of overall probability of death or disease of all types in old age. But it's, it's a very, it, it's not an exact science, but like that. When I've been lucky enough to have my biological age tested, which I've been able to do maybe four times now over the past decade or more, the test I've been able to get done on me um, involved measuring probably 150 different things in my blood, as well as 
you know, all manner of physiological and cognitive tests. So, you know, there's no one number that comes out of that. Really, I mean, there's no one useful number. What The only thing that really usefully comes out of it is what to pay most attention to, what your what seems to be changing more rapidly or seems to be a problematic level for those of other people of your own chronological age, those sorts of things. Right, right. So those 130 markers, would many of them fit within your 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 seven areas of of damage going to be related to that? Mm. Oh, certainly not. Okay. Certainly not, no. Because the things that one measures in the blood are metabolites. These are small molecules that are constantly being ingested into the body or synthesized by the body or destroyed by the body or excreted from the body. You know, the bloodstream is just this pipeline, right? It's just this, this network of roads that take things from one place to another, and particularly it's short-lived molecules, whereas the seven types of damage that I talk about are types of molecule or cell, molecular or cellular change that accumulate over time. So, in other words, yes, the concentration of a particular small molecule in the blood may change, but that's because of a change, a, of subtle changes in the set point, in the equilibrium between synthesis and destruction or ingestion and excretion of those molecules, which are kind of readouts of the level of damage elsewhere, maybe of the activities of enzymes or the activities of, of the numbers of certain cells, for example, but they are not the damage itself. They are readouts of the damage. Okay. Okay, great. So if we wanted to live longer today, I mean, I, I know one answer, which we're going to definitely come up with um, at the end is which talk about like um, helping you fund the different areas because, you know, you see that as the, mo the most important to targeting these areas that we're not really looking at. But if we were to, for the people at home who uh, are concerned about their longevity, what would be the best strategy for them in terms of thinking about their own health? Yeah, I wish I wish I had a better answer to this. I really do. Certainly, I know that there are some people, I mean, if you're an unlucky person, so Ray Kurzweil, I'll come back to Ray Kurzweil again, because, of course, he's well known as someone who thinks that one can make a big difference to one's longevity using supplements and so on. He probably is making a substantial difference to his own longevity that way, but that's because his own longevity by default was probably going to be rather shorter than average. He mm -hmm. has a lot of cardiovascular disease in his family. He came down with type 2 diabetes in his 30s, which is pretty unusual, even though it's not unheard of. Um, and he's been able to really completely fix that using his regime that he developed himself. And I totally applaud that. But what I can't do is say that this would apply to people who are already doing okay, especially being better than average like me. Only if you're somehow unlucky that we have simple ways that may be able to somewhat normalize your rate of aging. Now, of course, on top of that, there is the fact that there are plenty of ways to substantially shorten your longevity by smoking or getting seriously overweight or eating a very you know, poor diet, for example. But, you know, you didn't need me to tell you that. That was what your mother told you. So, unfortunately, over and above that, as things stand, we cannot point to anything that can appreciably help most people. And that, of course, is why I always say the only thing you can really do is buy more time, not by extending the time that you stay healthy, but by reducing the time before therapies come along that will actually do much more than anything that exists today. Right. So, um... I'll kind of run by you the, the way I think about this and, and see uh, if, if you have ideas on this and you think this is a decent idea or not. The way I talk to my friends and stuff when they ask me these kinds of questions is that I say, well, basically you want to manage your biggest risks, right? So if you have, um, like you were talking about, um, like Ray Kurzweil has cardiovascular risk in his, his family. So if, for instance, you had a 23andMe or other, other set of genetic tests, which point out that with some probability you have for instance, I have a, a higher risk of lung cancer than most people and um, a couple of other things in my profile and people have different risks. So I suggest they look at that and then potentially they look for the biomarkers related um, to that on an ongoing basis rather than the ge genetic longer term risk. And they monitor that and they also look into some of the, the things that can reduce that specific health risk and uh, to reduce the risk, to limit the risk of, of them actually getting that or their biggest risk. So it's kind of like plugging the biggest, the biggest gaps they have um, or shortening their, their lifespan. And I'm just wondering, you think that's a reasonable approach? For sure. I think in general, for most people, if you've got a risk factor that puts you at risk of being considerably shorter lived than average, then 
you're going to know about it as a consequence of the kinds of metabolic tests I was talking about. But there can certainly be exceptions to that, things that essentially don't really affect your health as, by, uh, as measured in normal ways until, until they do, until they suddenly you know, come up and bite you in the backside. Um, so that's the kind of thing that um, a, a 23 me analysis might uncover. However, one's also got to be extremely careful in evaluating that kind of data because ultimately it arises from basic science. It arises from people studying particular genetic uh, variations in the population and identifying correlations between those variants and the instance of this or that disease. And those studies are notoriously difficult to do, and they have a notoriously low level of reproducibility because different populations are different and because sample sizes are limited and so on and so forth. Thank you. I always appreciate your answers because, you know, they, they, they provide a different context and perspective to like everyone else. So it's always very interesting um, to get that feedback. Let's talk a little bit about the SENS organization and what you're up to there, um, because this is your vision basically for making it happen. So you have different activities, and also a little bit about the Methuselah Foundation, which you were formerly part of, and I understand that is also has some similar activities, although it's going about it in the same way, in a different way, rather. Sure. Yeah, let me actually start with the Methuselah Foundation, because that makes more sense chronologically. Um, the Methuselah Foundation is a charity, a 501c3, that was created by myself and a businessman from Virginia named David Goebel in 2002, late 2002. Our goal was, of course, to hasten the defeat of aging. We didn't have any money. So we started out creating prizes creating competitions in which we encourage people to give us money that would go into a prize pot and that the competition would be to beat the prevailing world record for mouse longevity. That was all you had to do. You had to get a mouse to live longer than any mouse had ever lived before. And it was, of course, you know, we weren't saying how it would be done and we set things up so that even a small improvement would be enough to win some proportion of the prize pot. And it worked. Basically, our goal was to raise the profile of longevity research, to get the word out and to get people more interested in the possibility of developing medicine to postpone ill health of old age. But we were bringing all this money in. At around about 2005 or so, we had enough money that we felt we could spend some of the prize pot in advance on actually pursuing specific research projects. So that's what we started to do. And it, things started going pretty well in that regard. Um, but then we had a problem, which we started to recognize in about 2008, which was that if you're a research organization, you've got to obviously make sure that you impress people with your competence and your, um, you know, your, um, uh, you've got your feet on the ground and everything like that, and you've got, you're doing the right stuff. Um, whereas if you're a PR organization trying to, you know, um, you know, get people motivated and so on, then you want to be rather the opposite. You want to be very, you know, populous and superficial and, and glitzy. So we felt that it would actually serve the mission better if these two um, things of our activities were pursued in two different organizations, which would thereby be able to have very different styles of discourse, styles of communication. So that's why we created Sense Research Foundation, which was founded in 2009, Sense Research Foundation, of course, is also a charity, a 501c3, so anyone can get tax back. And actually, because this is going out internationally, I should probably mention that we have a subsidiary in the UK which is able to take tax-deductible donations not only from UK citizens but also from most of mainland Europe. And if anyone wants to know about that, they can contact us on the website and we'll tell them more. Um, Thanks for all the links in the show notes. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, yeah, so, so we created Central Research Foundation and essentially the Methuselah Foundation divested all of the assets that had been given us for research into the new foundation. So both foundations have continued in parallel since that time and I think we've both done pretty well. Um, it's pretty good. So Central Research Foundation, to go into a bit more detail, we're headquartered in Mountain View, California, just a little south of San Francisco. And we have about 5,000 square feet of space in our facility, most of which is lab space. We have a variety of projects going on here. But actually more than two-thirds of our research budget 
is different, not in our facility, but rather in funding university labs. Again, mostly in the USA, but some elsewhere. Um, we have one in Cambridge, outside Cambridge, at the Pebram Institute. And uh, these projects are focused on all of the various areas of research that SENS describes. Yes, and I don't think we've um, said actually what SENS stands for. Um, Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. So... That's right. We don't often try to spell that out because it is a bit of a tongue twister. The name originally arose because of, well, basically historical reasons within gerontology. The phrase negligible senescence already had a particular technical meaning and it seemed like a good place to start. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tongue twister. So we, just, we, just, we don't bother to get people to remember that anymore. Great. Thanks. Well, I'll put links to all of those, um, of course, in the show notes. One last thing I just wanted to ask you, Aubrey, is um, from a personal personal stance, you've said that you know every few years you're going to test 130 markers or so of your own. Are there any specific things you feel are important for you to personally track about your body for longevity, health, or performance? Um, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I think that, first of all, coming back to something that we were talking about earlier, if any one marker is out of whack you know it seems like it's really look telling a much more pessimistic story than the rest then you've certainly got to try to ask yourself why ask yourself whether it really is an outlier whether it actually has as much impact given everything else as people say things like that but it's definitely not something that it would be a good idea to ignore so um my one outlier the past couple of times i've done this kind of thing it's been homocysteine i have not, not i'm not really sure why my homocysteine level is unusually high because everything else that it's supposed to interact with is not but you know it's still something that i pay attention to but from that well i can certainly say that there are certain things that i feel are really at the nexus of metabolism things that really if they're extremely good then you're, you're pretty safe whatever else is going on, pretty much whatever else is happening. Um, Insulin is the best one. So, of course, insulin is the hormone that um, mediates the absorption of sugar after you eat a sugar-rich meal so that the overall concentration of sugar in the bloodstream is maintained at as constant a level as possible. And the uh, precursor of diabetes, of type 2 diabetes, is something called insulin resistance, where the cells that take up sugar in response to insulin, which is mainly muscle cells, start to be a little sluggish about it and to only respond when they're given a large amount of insulin. So if your insulin is high, then even if your glucose tolerance, as it's called, your ability to normalize your glucose in the blood is still good, the, the indication is that it won't be good for very long. Whereas if your glucose tolerance is good and also your insulin is really low, then that says that you're in the best possible state. I would say that if we had one thing, that would be it. Perhaps another one would be, would be triglycerides. Those are a type of fat which it seems to be good to have very little of in your bloodstream. And again, I'm pleased to say that I do. Yeah, thank you very much, because those are basically the biggest diseases uh, we have today, like metabolic syndrome. So those are good markers for that. I guess one of the confusions with biomarkers we're always facing is that we're not sure if it's the end point. So one last question I did have for you was on a Palo Alto longevity prize. I'm not sure if you know about that. I certainly do. I'm an advisor to it. Oh, great, great. Because I understand they're running a competition, um, or they have been running a competition for heart rate variability in connection with longevity. That's right, yes. So uh, Billisman in the Bay Area in June Yoon has put up a million dollars as a prize fund for progress against uh, against aging. And this is divided actually into two separate prizes. One of them is looking specifically at heart rate variability, as you say. Uh, but the other one is a little bit more general. It's looking at what they call homeostatic control or something like that. I forget the exact terminology. But uh, the point here is that the um, competition is for the attempt to actually extend longevity in a model organism in this manner. And I think this is great. I mean, the high variability aspect is a bit um, unusual. Most people have not really bought into the idea that this could be a, a really a real fulcrum of aging, but it might be. And I think I think it's great to encourage research in any area that it hasn't been terribly well looked at. The main thing, though, is simply putting a million dollars on the table 
is a great way to get people pretty excited. And a lot of people are paying attention now, um, especially since in the Bay Area there's a lot of you know, the identity of people interested in longevity in general. It's a great place for Sense Research Foundation to be located as well for us. So yes, I absolutely applaud you for doing this. Great, great, great to hear you're part of that also, because we'd heard about that from another uh, previous guest. Um, well, Aubrey, thank you for so much for your time today. I'd love to hear all of your different ideas, of course, because you're working at a very high level compared to most people. So, you know, you have this um, perspective that stands back, back a bit, which um, it can be very helpful to people. So thank you very much for your time and have a great day. Thank you. And to you. Bye-bye. Bye. To get more of The Quantified Body, subscribe on iTunes or go to the website verquantifiedbody.net. That's T-H-E-Q-U-A-N-T-I-F-I-E-D-B-O-D-Y dot N-E-T. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, we are at twitter.com slash quantifiedbody. And on Facebook, we are at facebook.com forward slash quantifiedbodypodcast. If you've got feedback or requests for the show, you can email them to me at damien at thequantifiedbody.net. That's D-A-M-I-E-N at thequantifiedbody.net. Thanks for joining the show this week. See you next time.